All right. Um, I'm, I'm the, so we're going to be talking about uh, IoT and IIoT and, uh, and some of the technology components that support um, those aspects of it. We're going to go deep into the aspects of, of why and, and, and the how, um, and then definitely get into the what at the, at the end of the uh, presentation um, and, and give a demo. So um, before we jump into it, who am I? Uh, I'm Sunil Manji. I'm a, a principal solution engineer at Cloudera. Uh, my expertise belongs in the IoT or resides in the IoT or IIoT space, um, specifically in manufacturing. Uh, I spent a number of years in, in manufacturing, uh, obviously telecom, uh, geospatial, and been with Cloudera roughly, uh, roughly four years. Tim, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Tim Spann, I'm a principal data flow field engineer for Cloudera. I've been at Cloudera Hortonworks for four or so years. Before that, I was at uh, Pivotal. I've done uh, a lot of NiFi. Before that, I did uh, some IoT with a real-time energy startup. So I got a little bit of experience. All right. So I want to be respectful of time here. Uh, Two twenty-five. We'll call it the uh, call it an end to, to for questions. So what we'll do today is we'll kind of dive into IoT and IIoT. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about protocols. Um, I think this is the uh, this is some of the pitfalls of IoT or IIoT solutions is uh, the protocol. So we'll go fairly deep into that. Talk about fog and uh, edge edge, uh, edge and fog computing. Uh, technical architecture, and then we'll kind of go through a live demonstration of manufacturing sensor data um, streaming through through the solution set. So before we jump into it, just on a pure numbers basis, uh, we have roughly over um, 120,000 IoT um, uh, Minify agents installed um, at the edge at one of our uh, customer bases. And why am I mentioning this is because not to not to uh, you know to talk about how amazing and how difficult this was, but actually to talk more about some of the challenges that we hit when we did come to the scale of 120. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're continuing to expand, and we followed a lot of thought leadership in I IoT and IIT, and um, excuse me, IIoT. And we found that there wasn't a lot of real thought leadership in terms of some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges. So you'll see that I'll be completely transparent in, in where we do good and where we do not. We're in as an industry, uh, from a technical perspective, we have major gaps. So what is IIoT to set the table stakes? I, IoT is is anything that um, that could produce data sets, right? Telemetry data it doesn't matter what kind of data sets you're talking about, but they're very IT focused. Uh, and we as Cloudera and most vendors in this space understand IT fairly well, right? That's what our specialty is. However, on the other side of IIoT, which is a subset of IoT, there's a significant um, antiquated protocols that most of us have never heard of. And typically um, the thoughts here is why doesn't this industry just use IT protocols? And that's not going to work. Their protocols are highly efficient, they work, and they're revenue generating, right? Tied to revenue generating, uh, generating operating systems. So for that reason, when we talk about IoT and IIoT, there's a cross-pollination of these two um, ecosystems. And even though IIoT is a subset of IoT, you really have to think about the entire comprehensive solution set to be able to um, take it forward when it comes to actually edge deployment. So what is IT protocols? Just to kind of table set on that, is we've seen it. If anyone's on the IT space, um, I bet most of us can probably talk about six or seven or maybe 10. Some of us can probably talk about all of these protocols that we've worked at at some point in our career, right? Totally makes sense. These are the protocols that most folks do not know. Uh, I'd be willing to bet that not many of us have seen this, right? Most people think Modbus is the, uh, the popular one. 
But the reality is Mod Bus is just a tip of the um, iceberg, right? Uh, this is, I would say, one one hundredth uh, or one one thousandth of the number of protocols that are available in operational technology. And the challenge is in, in IT, we don't understand this language. And a lot of times this language is proprietary. Um, a lot of times in the IT side, it's open source, right? So it's super easy to work with. But here you're not going to get these vendors or these vendors that support these protocols to all of a sudden take their source code and make it open. So how do we get over that challenge? And where do we find these uh, connect or this operational, these uh, protocols that I was talking about? Generally, you'll find these protocols in manufacturing, but they are littered outside of manufacturing as well. Uh, you'll find them in plants and manufacturing plants and refineries and, and drill sites. And a lot of times you will find these protocols in areas where there's decent connectivity, IoT, uh, connectivity back to the mothership. And what I mean by that is when you install an edge device and try to capture data, you can quite easily send it over back to the data center or to the cloud, no challenge, right? The connectivity exists. But then there's also a set of deployments that the network connectivity is very rare or very low and like trains, planes, automobiles, right? And they also create additional complexity in terms of not only connectivity. For example, I, I work with a customer that um, deploys edge agents in the middle of the Gulf Ocean. I, I'm located in Houston, Texas. So I work uh, primarily in oil and gas. Um, what we get as a connectivity in the middle of the Gulf is very different than what you get in Houston, Texas, going back to Baytown, for example. Big difference, right? In the deployment model and how you deploy I, um, IoT sensors, uh, I'm sorry, edge capture agents is very different, right? We have to think about the entire space completely differently. Uh, if there's a change that needs to happen on the agent itself, it's not readily available. The other piece that's complicated between the two different ecosystems is the compute that's available. There's two main two main thoughts when it comes to IoT edge computing and fog computing. And I'll dive into this a little bit further. But at a high level, edge compute computing is the theory that you want to actually compute on the actual device itself, the PLC devices, or the sensor itself. I think that's very rare, right? But having compute on the sensor itself, because the sensor is a pretty dummy agent. It doesn't do a lot. It's supposed to do one thing. It's just create a reading. But there's thoughts out there that you can actually put, a sense, uh, put an agent and do the reading on a sensor itself. I would say what's more, um, uh, what, what is a pattern that's well established is fog computing. Fog computing is the concept where you still have the sensors, you still have the PLC devices, but you have a micro data center or a small box or boxes that are called edge gateways. And within these edge gateways is where the compute is available. And these PLC devices or, or these sensors come and talk directly to the edge gateway. Right? Many of the manufacturing industries understand edge gateway very well. And that's where you perform the compute. So what about edge computing, right? Because it seems like I'm advocating for fog. Not really, but let me explain where the challenge is when we talk about I IoT and IIoT. We hit this when we did our large scale deployment of my first slide of 100 or a couple slides, 120,000 plus deployments. When someone says, I want to deploy on the edge, I would challenge you, what do you mean? And where is that? So I'll give you an example. If you have an iWatch or Samsung um, uh, watch, generally that's an edge device, right? And there's not a lot of compute available on these things. Same thing with UBI. By the way, UBI stands for usage-based insurance. Uh, the plug and play devices uh, that uh, insurance companies offer, they're generally Dan Law devices. And those Dan Law devices plug into your car, not a lot of compute available, but then if, if there's a requirement that says, I want to run compute on that, on that device, really? So we really think about like, how does the path, how, how do you actually do the compute? And you think about it and you go, oh, hold on. The iPhone generally has a coprocessor, which is the, the mobile phone, which is the iPhone. What I noticed on my iPhone, on my iWatch, is that there was very rare, um, very little information about my health statistics when I just had the iWatch. But then when I turned it into and I connected it with my iPhone, I immediately got information about how my health is over a week, 
my month. It pushed me harder. It actually said, oh, by the way, your heart rate is out of spec within, you know, what I generally my resting heart rate is. A ton of more information was available. And it was not by coincidence. The compute that's available on the edge, simply we do not have enough. So you generally have a co-processor like a phone. Same thing with usage-based insurance. With usage-based insurance devices, um, if you, uh, for example, uh, uh, if you're an Allstate, I'm an Allstate customer. If you plug in your, your device, they tell you to download their app on your phone. That's not coincidence. There's a reason why they do that. It's because that download device connects to your iPhone. It doesn't matter if you're progressive. All of them require you to install an application on your iPhone. And what that does is it essentially says when they're near each other, it will ship the data from the usage-based uh, device over to the to your mobile uh, to your tab uh, to your tablet or your phone, and from that device it will do the compute and send it over back to um, to the mothership where the insurance companies can analyze how you're how you're behaving. But here's also the differentiation of what we have to understand at edge computing. It's not enough to move data off of these devices. Any technical solution has to do bidirectional. And any technical solution that has to do bidirectional is, for example, uh, I cannot mention this customer's name, but they, they were streaming data off of the usage-based insurance onto their, uh, I, um, their tablets, uh, the phones. What customers quickly realized is that their behaviors over a month would drive their end of month or, or their six month period of what, they're, um, uh, what they need to pay the insurance companies. The challenge is what if I had a bad day or I had a bad couple of days, right? And I would like to know that am I influencing my rate? So what we're doing now is we're able to stream data off of the usage-based insurance devices onto the, ta onto the mobile phone. And on the mobile phone itself, we can detect if these behaviors are out of spec. For example, if you're driving for a three-day period that's just buck wild, we can actually inform the user that, oh, by the way, you continue doing this, you're not going to be so happy with your, um, with your six-month premium. And so you can immediately change your behaviors, right? It doesn't need to always go back to the mothership. So you have to think through the entire life cycle of not just moving data off of the devices, but how do you make this, this co-device or co-processor be able to ship data back to the actual device that's capturing the, the data set. In fog, it's slightly different, but mimics a, a behavior that's, um, that is recognizable by the, by the previous pattern. In fog computing, you generally have an edge gateway, right? You have your refineries, you have your manufacturing plants, you have your airline industry where they are shipped all of these airlines, the Airbuses and Boeings, they all ship the edge gateways as a part of uh, their fleet. And inside of this edge gateway is where all the devices and instrumentations speak to the edge gateway. And from there is the challenge of how do we move these data sets from the edge gateway over to the data center or to a geo-distributed data center and to be able to run the compute. And that generally happens uh, by, by uh, t uh, going through a aggregator. The reason why you want an aggregator in this scenario is most enterprises will never allow you to go directly from the L3 or the, uh, the, where your equipment is directly to the data center. It doesn't matter if you're in the cloud in Azure, AWS, Google, or if it's an on-prem, it's just not gonna happen, right? Manufacturing is very tight in the way they do the Purdue model. So for that reason, you generally need to go through some layers. And in fact, you can do some filtering and do some compute and go right back to the manufacturing plants or to the aircraft and say that there's a behavior we need to detect. So this geo-distributed data center is a ton of benefits, not only from a security perspective, but also going bi-directional. And then finally, back to the data center. So applying the technical solution to it, right? What we did um, in the, in the 120,000 plus deployment, what we did is we took Minify and deploy it on the edge gateway, Apache Minify. And what Apache Minify's role in this technical stack is to capture the data set and send it downstream, right? You can do some filtering, you can do compression, all that greatness, but then it will go to NiFi, which NiFi will be the, the, um, uh, the aggregator where it accepts the data sets, does more compute, and then it can ship it downstream to Kafka and, and then Flink for analysis. And we'll walk through what that actually looks like. But here's the, here's the major gap. 
we talked about that Cloudera and most vendors in this space, and I would say even open source across all open source projects, we do a great job of IT support, but we do not do a good job of OT support. It's because they're littered with proprietary protocols, right? So what do you have to do? For example, generally you'll find in, in the IoT industry that no one, one vendor does it all, right? It's generally a partnership with other vendors that have um, knowledge and domain expertise in the OT side. So for example here, um, Litmus Automation. I've worked with them very closely. I've been very impressed with just their agileness. And what I, what I find is they, they support many OT protocols. But they do the OT side very well, right? They're able to talk Modbus and Hard IP and many and um, PI Connect. They're able to do a lot of different protocols that we as a technical company don't understand. And most technical vendors do not. So what we do is we take care of the IT side. As a software, the OT software like Litmus Automation accepts the data and sits on the edge gateway. Minify sits within, uh, within Litmus Automation or software like Litmus Automation and says, I will take care of shipping the data to Kafka or to Spark or to Flink. It doesn't matter. But those are all IT protocols after that. So the first layer is, or what you call southbound connections, are all OT protocols. And everything northbound is uh, IT protocols, which is what we and most vendors are good at. So what does the revised technical architecture look like? And this is what it is, right? So you still have the edge gateway, you still have all the components. Really, the only difference is we included litmus automation here. And again, litmus automation sits on the edge gateway itself. Minify sits within uh, litmus automation. And then we can continue to do the, the entire downstream bi-directional flow. And we can and Minify can go and talk to litmus itself if there's a behavior that we need to detect. So to demo this all out, what we'll show is, again, litmus auto, real data, litmus automation, sending data. Uh, I, I believe we're going to be showing uh, temperature data and uh, vibration data. Now, I know vibration data is, is, a, is a hot topic for those that work in our industry. Many vendors say vibration data is a combination of acceleration, velocity, and displacement. Fine. But there are a lot of vendors that um, sit out there that say, look, we'll do all that a correlation for you and just give you a single measurement, which is vibration. So we're gonna do that, right? We're gonna have, uh, we're gonna capture temperature data and vibration data. We're gonna run it through NiFi. Um, and those are two distinct streams. And then we're gonna run that through Kafka. And then finally, we're gonna correlate that over a one minute uh, tumbling window. Actually, that's not accurate. We're gonna, we're gonna correlate that over a 10 second tumbling window to determine if there's any out of spec condition between temperature and vibration. Generally, a real use case, you have um, a gamut of, of uh, uh, readings that you want to correlate. But typically, when you talk to manufacturing experts, temperature, vibration are, are the two um, low hanging fruits that you want to capture, and you can get a ton of insights. So I'm going to jump to the demo. Um, Tim, do you have anything to add, or can I jump right into it? No, oh, let's see some demo, man. This is cool okay. stuff. People like All right. That. So um, I, I do want to. I want to be cognizant of time, so I, I believe I have just a few minutes left. Um, so this is litmus automation. This is uh, this is actually sitting on the edge gateway itself, right? And it's capturing data. And what you can see here is that we have the 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 actual. It's plugged into a device, and we are pulling temperature and vibration data, right? And, and we're not doing, like Minify is not doing anything, right? This is the OT side. They speak all these protocols. But we know what we care about is we need these two data sets. So how do we do that? So within Litmus Automation and other vendors can do similar things, what we can do is we can have Minify running inside of Litmus Automation. So this is a Minify container. And Minify's container is sitting there, and it's listening to port 7002. Now, how did this all happen? I'll show you this in just a moment. But the important point to understand is Litmus is taking data, capturing data, and sending it locally to the agent that's installed with it, right, within that container. And the flow, if, if you're curious what it looks like, it's pretty simple. This is loop flows, and it's capturing the two, the vibration data, the temperature data, doing a quick transformation, and then it's sending it over to its local self. And if I double click into it, you can see, um, if you, if you, if you um, let me see here, it doesn't show it here. But what this is doing is it's sending it to the local 7002 port. So how does that work? Because what I showed you earlier is Minify is running 
inside of a, a container, but how does this container know what to do? So what we did is when we launched Minify, we launched it with the Docker, just a Docker standard Docker command, but then we created um, a, a, a parameter called litmus agent. And this class, how this works is when, when Minify is launched on a, a inside a container, or if it's a, sitting on a Windows laptop or Windows server or, or uh, Linux machines, it doesn't matter. They all have a class associated with it. You can call it class anything. You can call it class Sunil, class Tim. But anytime an agent identifies itself as a class, the con command and control center is where that agent shows up. So you notice here that I have litmus agent as a class. So any agent that identifies itself as a litmus agent will run the, the uh, whatever the workflow instructions are. So for example, over here, it's pretty simple, right? This is a drag and drop interface of being able to say, hey, I want on whatever agent that um, identifies itself as litmus agent, I want to uh, listen on local port 7002 and the base path is litmus. So basically whatever a local path 7002 dash litmus, right? Nothing fancy here. But then we do want to send the data somewhere. So this is listening, but then we want to send the data somewhere. So here in this example, we're actually sending it over to NIFI. This NIFI endpoint is there listening on, and here's my URL, point 7003, and uh, I'm using a post. Pretty simple. There's nothing fancy going on here, right? We're taking the temperature and vibration data, sending it over to NIFI. Going over to NIFI, NIFI is sitting out here, sitting and listening to the, uh, to the temperature and vibration data. And what we want to do is we want to route See, it's a single port, right, 7002, but we want to route the data to the corresponding Kafka topic. We want to send it to vibration. We want to send it to Kafka topic. So in NiFi, we're able to do a lot of fancy things of kind of route on, on the stream itself. We can do a transformation. We remove some text that don't make a lot of sense. And then we finally persist it to Kafka. So at this point, we've gone through capturing the data set. We've gone through um, uh, uh, capturing, on, uh, capturing on litmus is handing it over to Minify, Minify then sending a NIFI. So now this is the this is the local aggregator, if you remember the chart. And now we need to ship it to Kafka. And Kafka's here and we shipped it. So inside of Kafka, you can see that I have two different, um, this is the UI in Kafka that Cloudera has built for monitoring and taking a look. And you can see here that I have a producer and it's producing the two different distinct partitions. So you can see here that I have a vibration topic and I have a temperature topic. And I can also take a look at the data that's being streamed into it real time as well. So what I need to do next, and here's some of the, the JSON data that we were receiving from the actual manufacturing device. All right, cool. So we have it. We have the data. We have vibration data and Kafka. The last step that we want to do is we want to be able to read from that stream, uh, those two streams. So what I do here is I create some in Flink SQL. So in Flink SQL, I'm going to run Flink SQL streaming. And I want to read that temperature data, and I want to read the vibration data. I want to correlate those two streams together. So here you can see here I have Kafka, uh, temperature, uh, uh, reading, um, reading from the temperature topic. So I'm going to go ahead and create this table called temp. And I have the same thing here called uh, vibration. And I'm going to go ahead and create, and again, it's a completely different topic, right? So we have two different streams. So we have the two tables created. I finally want to correlate. I'm going to go and kick off the streaming SQL. What I want to do now is I want to correlate the vibration data to the temperature data. If I go back to the stream for, uh, go back to the slide for just a moment, this is what we're trying to do, right? Litmus, we're generating vibration and temperature data. It comes through NIFI, which I showed you. We persisted to Kafka. We saw some data on Kafka. And then finally, we want to run a in SQL live stream to correlate over a 10 second window, not a one minute tumbling window and see that if there's any anomalies that we need to identify when it comes to vibration and temperature analysis. It takes just a moment to run here. So here you go. So you can see here that every 10 seconds, you can see here the, the 10 and the 20, I'm going to get the average temperature and the average vibration between the two. And they need to fit in between a spec, like every vendor that generates the manufacturing equipment, the instrumentation will always say that 
the the spec of this is under normal condition between you know 70 and 80 and temperature should be between 150 to 160. So you can continue to pulsate through this, iterate through this over and over again to determine if there's any out of spec conditions. I am over two minutes for questions. That is it. I know I speak very fast, uh, but again, just going summarizing what we did. When we talked about the IT protocols, the OT protocols, which is the general gap in the technology of IIoT and um, IoT that most do not talk about. We talked about the challenges of compute and networking that's available. And then we spoke about how do we actually overcome those challenges by introducing OT vendors and IT vendors. And then finally showing how, the, how you can end the loop by creating a stream through NiFi to Kafka to Flink SQL. Thank you, any questions? Yeah, we should have about 10 minutes left, I think. I think we have till 3.35. I gotta show you about yeah. Flink SQL catalogs so you don't have to create that table manually. If you connect it to schema registry, it'll automatically pull in every schema you have defined matched up to those Kafka topics. So they just show up in the catalog and you don't have to do a great tab catalog and lose it every time you restart the uh, Flink SQL. Very nice. How does Minify compare to Node Red? Yeah. Um, so Node Red is, so one of the challenges in Node Red is that it, it has a very limited um, operating system support. That's number one. Uh, number two, it has very limited uh, connectivity to um, the OT protocol side. So again, not a lot of thoughts about uh, how Node Red will tackle the OT uh, side of the house. In general, um, I don't see Node Red in the wild. What I see most of the time in the wild is uh, when you talk about IoT. I'm seeing things like Uber Agent and things like that that do the general capturing. Not really no, uh, Node Red. Tim, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I've seen people use it in demos, but no, I haven't seen it at any companies out there. It, it looks kind of fun, but I, I like you said, they probably isn't someone with a hundred thousand nodes out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, the customers we work with, they are looking for enterprise grade support, right? So. I'm just not sure I, I see it in the wild or some of the largest customers wanting to go down that route. But again, I, I don't know much about that window or that product. Yeah, the, the Flink SQL thing was really cool. I think we have to uh, have you distill this demo up because there's a lot of cool features in there already. And once, once we have a web UI for this, though, I love your background uh, behind the uh, Flink SQL client. I was trying to find one that worked for me. I, I like what you did there. It makes it uh, look a lot cooler than a uh, command line. It, it makes me less uh, homicidal during the week. Yeah, that's smart. Because I just have <laughs> like a, I don't, what color do I have? I have like a blue screen and that's just not doing, but having those catalogs, those, those will make you a happy day. You'll load your schema and it just shows up and you just, right. You could describe the table. You don't have to worry about it. It matches it up. So what I do is I auto load all my schemas from uh, the REST API. And then once I start pushing data to it, I can go to Flink SQL and all my tables are there. That's kind of nice. I'm not able to see the question page for some reason. So uh, yeah, I, I could see it. It's in the chat. There's not much going on. There was a little discussion on uh, another project, PLC for X, which does some of the lower level stuff, which uh, would be cool to marry with Minify uh, for some projects. Again, if there's a vendor that supports that and make it easier for getting that uh, deployed uh, for uh, you know personal projects, that seems awesome. But it, it, the, our hard part is always finding someone who will give you a commercial support so I can get that installed in a car or truck or manufacturing plants. I mean, most of them are a little more open to open source than they were before. But if there isn't some vendor 
and some guy to yell at, they, they're not happy. Putting a JIRA ticket doesn't work for most of them. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's that's why that's why we looked at litmus, right? Because we oh, there's there's support there. That's a good one. He's yeah. got some vendor support there, so that's cool. Yeah. Well, we'll have to take a look at that. Always yeah. looking for a supported Apache projects, which is very cool. Uh, yeah, we have some people doing for uh, Minify to collect log and click data or using Nify. Depends where the uh, logs and events are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we, I mean, it depends. Click data is, when you talk about logs, logs is, you know, for example, gen, uh, building a universal pipeline. Right of logs, uh, that's really not a, a, a minified case unless you're looking at where you if, if we're able to collect the click data or the log data at its origination, which is generally on a Linux or a Windows box. Then minify. And, and by the way, that 120,000 number I shared earlier, that is a combination of um, Windows uh, 2008, 2012, 2016. 2019, Windows 7, Windows 10, Linux, uh, I think it's Red Hat, CentOS, uh, SUSE, and I think that's about it. But generally, that's where we're collecting their data. And then now we're collecting it on, on the OT side. Yeah, for uh, there's uh, some questions on some other projects. I was just going to bring up with the, the stuff you're doing with NiFi Stateless. Yeah, so. You, you mean like how we're using NetFi Stateless? Yeah, because mm -hmm. you have a couple of interesting use cases I've seen you mention. Yeah, that. yeah. So NetFi Stateless is is um is basically NetFi Stateless, exactly what it is. So what we do is we run NetFi Stateless on OpenShift. So one of the one of the things that NIFI, we're having trouble with NetFi is that you know it does require a server based architecture, but when it comes to uh, scaling, uh, when uh, in auto scaling, inflating up and down. We found that OpenShift or Kubernetes is just much more uh, friendly in that manner, but we couldn't really port that over, uh, NiFi port that over very easily. So instead, what we have is NiFi Stateless, which what it does essentially um, de deploying a single flow, which I showed earlier. But what it does is it, it, it creates the acknowledgement from when it cre uh, uh, receives a transaction, and it only acknowledges when it uh, finishes the transaction when it persists the last processor. So for example, if you're receiving log data and they're doing a transformation of XML to JSON, and then you go from JSON and you do another thing, and then you go to Kafka, well, that typically is one transaction. So what we did is NatFi Stateless says, we're not gonna hold a state, individual processors. We're just gonna say that when we receive the data and do the transformations and persist to Kafka, that's a single transformation, uh, that's a single event. So what we did is now, uh, um, I went to our customer sites, we deployed NatFi Stateless. All log data, cybersecurity data is uh, sent over to OpenShift. OpenShift, uh, NatFi Stateless is there listening to port 5001. And then it does a transformation and persists to Kafka. And it can auto inflate and deflate because it's running a single event at a time, right? So it's true event based, um, event based architecture. Yeah, Minify T is IT first. That's right. Yeah, I mean, we don't have we don't have a lot of the native uh, OT connectors, as you mentioned, and we probably never will unless the community does that or we work closely with one of these other projects, which we've looked at in the past. Unfortunately, I remember talking about that at the uh, Apache Con in Montreal and it just it never took off. But that would be a nice to see a couple of these. We have so ma many projects out there that uh, are doing pieces of this. Maybe if someone's out there leading that and pushing those together, you can make something interesting. I don't, I don't know who's uh, up for doing that. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, the trouble has been we we don't have a lot of open source supported OT software. Um, and I'm more than willing to listen, right, and go push that. But there isn't. I mean, um, and it has not only does it have to be supported, but it has to have the richness of OT protocol support. There's thousands of them, right? Uh, I think it's and very cute. It's very cute to say I have Modbus support. So what? Modbus doesn't mean anything, right? You have to support the thousands of protocols 
because you will see at a single customer site those thousand on a single plant. Yeah, no one gets rid of anything. They just add more stuff. <laughs> they don't, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know these projects, but I would love to dig into it. But we did our research. There's it's just the reality is it requires significant domain expertise and, and years of uh, industry expertise to actually go there. And again, it's littered with proprietary protocols. Well, we're pretty close to uh, end of time here. I don't know if you have any uh, thing you want to post, Neil, or any uh, final uh, thoughts. No, I, you know, again, my, my call to action, I guess we, we kind of already brought it up. I was hoping that, you know, with the community, we can, if there is some open source projects that are um, facilitating the OT, uh, the OT side, we would love to hear that. I would love to push that aspect of it. So that call to action is if there isn't, it'd be great to have something in the open source arena for that. But again, I, I understand why there isn't. And it's because of, you know, years and years of hundreds of years of just uh, domain expertise that kind of gets buried with some of these products. Yeah, and just not getting a license to to do these connections. I mean, Kuchmak worked in utilities, so he had access to it then. But once you're in the open as just a regular developer working at a software company, I can't get... Uh, you know, a free version of some uh, industrial piece of equipment and that particular interface and that proprietary software to deal with. That's where we kind of hit a wall of, unless that vendor is interested in being part of the community and they put part of it out in there and they open source with some kind of tester, that makes it really tough. Yeah, I mean, we, we reached out to a couple of OT vendors um, early in the year, pre-COVID, and the entry fee to just have a talk with them was roughly 100k. All right, 100k to have a conversation. I'm just not sure. That's. Uh, I like I, I I like to be on the receiving end of that conversation. 100 grand. Oh no, that won't work. Yeah. Right. I hope they they uh, save these chats when they. Uh, push this stuff out there's some useful stuff in there it is i know i took a screenshot so yeah i, I grabbed a, a couple things we'll see uh we'll see how it goes but yeah we definitely keep the conversation going that'd be very interesting if we could get something even if it's for one subset of one industry if someone has access to one really uh eager vendor that's not going to charge 100k so we could have, even if it's one solution, okay, we could do this one one machine in one type of factory and we could do it fully Apache the whole way. That would still be cool. Yeah, completely agree. Well, I think that that's it for us, but uh, thanks, Sunil. Uh This Thank is you. a really good talk. I know uh, probably going to do uh, future iterations of this at other events and meetups and whether you like it or not. Yeah. Uh, hey, thanks for the the feedback here. I, I caught a couple of links here, so I appreciate the feedback. And again, I put my information out there. So if you guys have any thoughts about the OT side, and I'd love to hear it, right? And I'm not going to pretend that I'm I'm an expert in all things OT. If there's if there's vendors out there that are open source and and open source savvy, let's 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 hear about it. Sounds good. So on to the next session. Thanks, right. everybody.